So hello everyone and welcome back to the last session of Contact with the More Than Human World. And our last session is also a screening and a talk with uh, Susan Shukli. And unfortunately, Faiza Ahmad Khan cannot be here today because of various reasons. So it's going to be only Susan who is going to talk today. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Susan before we move on to the screening. Susan Shukli is an artist researcher based in the UK whose work has explored the ways in which non-human witnesses such as materials and objects enter into public discourse and testify to historical events, especially those involving political violence, ethnic conflict and war crimes. Susan's research resulted in the monograph Material Witness, Media, Forensics, Evidence, published at MIT Press in 2020. And her current research and artistic production expands these legal investigations to examine how environmental systems and the transformations brought about by global warming are also generating new forms of evidence. Much of this work has been developed through the multi-year research project, Learning from ICE. Susan is also director of the Center for Research Architecture Architecture at Goldsmith University of London and is an affiliate artist researcher and board chair of forensic architecture. So now we are going to watch a short um, video and documentary about the project, Listening to Eyes, and then Susan is going to join us online and Jono will lead also the conversation with her.
इसको साइड रख दो भाई फायदा अगेन जो चीजें बहुत ज्यादा जरूरी हैं वही लेके जानी है ठीक है नो इंस्ट्रूमेंटेशन ठीक है जो एक्स्ट्रा इंस्ट्रूमेंट है वैसे भी यहाँ शूटिंग करनी करोगी नहीं आप so the glaciers like this in uh, ladakh region in general everywhere in the himalayan world actually they are the storage of water fresh water and they become very important if we talk about some dry areas like ladakh and zanskar because we don't have enough rain here this is rain shadow area and uh, the main source of water is uh, these glaciers and snow uh, during winters so basically the these uh, the local people here in these villages they are uh, using this water for their uh, you know municipal purposes as well as agriculture and because they are changing drastically now so the availability of water is changing uh, seasonality is changing so they these people in a local village they are the you know severely affected people because of these climate change you know uh, uh, impact on glacier and then the changes in river runoff So, Farouk, I think we need to paddle closer to the snout of the glacier and just really get a sense of where it's going to be most kind of dynamic. Um, you were saying that at this time of year there's probably less likely, less calving events, but um, I still think it's worth trying to see whether we can somehow capture some of those acoustic phenomena, even if it's maybe just the crackling of underwater ice or something like that. I don't know. What do you think? So we were there at uh, the hum factory having some big boulders. Yeah. 
it was good experience to go by uh, kayak there. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, means the idea was is to uh, take that route and then cross the glacier and then reach this site. Okay. Project Listening to Ice is trying to understand the phenomena and the condition of climate change through the acoustic register. So we're in this extraordinary environment here in northern India at the Drangdurn Glacier and we're about to go out into this glacier lake here which is at the mouth or what they say at the snout of the glacier and um, we have various hydrophones and so what we're going to try and do this afternoon is use our hydrophones to find the most acoustically dynamic and lively parts of the, of the lake, which will give us some indication as to, the, um, as to the activity and the behavior of the glacier, which of course is uh, undergoing kind of rapid transformations because of climate change and global warming. Once we do that today, so what, what we're effectively going to try and do using um, different hydrophones. One's a very, um, very highly sensitive ocean instrument and that we'll use that today and we'll actually be able to listen to the sounds of ice popping, maybe the uh, movement of underwater um, streams that are actually uh, carving channels through the glacier, the, the mass of the glacier. Um, so we'll use our technology today to determine uh, the various places in the lake that are the, potentially the most promising in terms of yielding acoustic data. Once we do that, we're actually going to um, we're going to lower a long-term um, acoustic instrument, and that instrument can, in principle, operate for six months. Um, in, and uh, acquire real-time data over a period of six months. And uh, once that sensor gets loaded, we have no opportunity to listen. So that's why we need to use today to actually find this sort of optimal location for then uh, lowering this very, um, you know, highly sort of technical kind of sensor that scientists use to monitor um, underwater events. And that, that that sensor will then sit at the bottom of this glacial lake for a while, uh, capturing data, and when it's retrieved, we'll look at that data and we'll try and determine the acoustic signature, if you will, of this glacier. So every glacier that uh, terminates in a water body um, produces a very specific acoustic signature. So, um, for example, when I was in Svalbard in Norway, uh, one of the things that you actually have to edit out of that um, acoustic data is the sound of sea lions and walruses and things like that because that's that's part of the acoustic signature of the uh, marine terminating glaciers in the fjords and so um, that would obviously produce a very misleading data set if you thought that that was a calving event for example so every glacier produces its own unique acoustic signature and that's really what we're trying to um, ultimately map in this um, glacial lake behind me here and then once we have that sort of baseline acoustic cartography, then we can you know, monitor the lake and activities over the course of many years to understand the changes that are taking place within the glacier. And so we're about to head out now that the uh, wind has died down a little bit and give it a try and see what we come up with today.
late again. Oh my god. We're really cold. They're really cold. My hands are cold. I know, yeah, it's just like, I need to warm up the first consider doing like this. There's Another. some tea in the. There's there some tea, yeah. so yeah. I can have some tea. Yeah. You got, you're holding the. Oh my god, the ice with you. You're holding on I got, to I got a full uh, sensorial yeah. experience of the ice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's cold. Yeah, oh my god. It's really cool. Thank you, thank you. What did you Yeah. Careful. But I don't think too many people have been in a glacial lake in the Himalayas with a hydrophone. Or even if they have, it's so very different. Don't you think, I, what I find is like a whole new world opens up that's yeah. so different than the world that you see. Because we never have, I, I never have that, mm, what do you say, I never look to the water and the ice in that world, right? Yeah. When I was listening to that voice, it was kind of different, what you were saying. And I think the, what do you say, whole uh, perspective also changes mm -hmm. because I've never, Use that instrument. I, I don't know about it, but it's quite interesting about the water. I think it's very scientific. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> it looked like you're experimenting in the water. You're struggling with the boat. Yeah, we were struggling with the boat. Yeah. The wind was quite harsh. Need to get into position. Uh -huh. Yeah, you did. You did an amazing job oh. paddling. I, I, I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> one day. You need to learn everything yeah. in the doctor. Normally, you, like we privilege sight over sound, but to reverse that and to focus on the hearing. And I wasn't actually really looking at the eye so much as I was trying to listen to it. I still feel like floating in the water. Well, I get, and you get this feeling like when you're above ground, there, there isn't that much to see. I mean, yeah. there's a lot to see, but when the microphone goes in the water, there's so much happening, and yet above you don't see any, you know, you don't see sort of yeah. evidence of that. Like, what is, what's the source of those sounds? Yeah, there's obviously rivers coming through, and then there's little chunks of ice floating through yeah. the water and everything. So, and that's what I love about the ice. And, I like those quiet little sounds that force you to pay attention. Huh.
I guess we're going to have a, a video link with Susan now. Great. So I'll uh, ask her a few questions uh, mm -hmm. about her practice and about this project. Um, and then I guess uh, if anybody else has questions for her, we can, uh, we can do that as well. Um, do we have about half an hour, something like that? Yeah, about half an hour, yeah. Ah, Susan. Hi, yeah, can you hear I'm me? Here. I can hear you. Um, yes, I can hear you. Can, hear you. can you hear me? Yep, can hear yeah. you perfectly. Lovely. Um, OK, uh, great to meet you, virtually meet you. Uh, I'm John O. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's lovely that you've been able to, to join us here. It's um, a shame that, that Pfizer couldn't also be with us. Um, but um, yeah, it's going to be fascinating to hear about this, uh, this project. So we've just watched the, uh, watched the, the film, which was uh, great, really, uh, really, really interesting. Um, and so I'm just going to invite you to, to speak a little bit uh, in a little bit more detail about, about the project. So, so first of all, what are the sort of origins of the, the, the project? How did it first come about, this idea of, uh, of monitoring the ice through sound? Um, yeah, great. Thanks so much for the invitation to participate. And just to say that Faiza lives in India, so she's she came to the UK a couple of on Monday to to do freelance work. And I spoke to her this morning, and like she's basically locked into the schedule through the 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 work that she's doing. Um, I did want to bring up some images, and I was given this clicker, and not. I can't see you, John, anymore, John o anymore, but I, nor can I see my images. Okay, there we go. Okay. Um, is it possible to bring up the still? I just wanted to have that, because um, I can see myself twice for some reason. Ah, okay. Um, I had, I, I, I sent in some stills that I thought would be helpful. Um, they were working fine previously. Okay. Okay, we can see can you we at the moment, those? but we'll see if uh, we'll see if uh, if the stills can be brought up on the screen as well. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so. Um, so hmm. Yes. So to give you a little bit of the um, background to the project, um, so I had been working on a um, a multi-year project called Learning from Ice which was taking me um, into different um, cryospheric contexts. And it began in the Canadian Ice Core Archive. And that, so I actually shot a documentary in this Ice Core Archive, and also, which was in Western Canada. And it has a very large collection of Arctic um, ice cores. And ice cores, for those who may not know, are perhaps the singularly most important uh, materials that are extracted from the earth to provide evidence of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, specifically methane and CO2, because ice cores that, which is based, it's drilling into the glacial ice sheets of the Arctic, Greenland, and Antarctica primarily. And you can, of course, coring is also done in subalpine regions as well. But the major core site is Antarctica and Greenland. And those cores that are extracted contain air from hundreds of thousands of years ago. So they provide what's considered a very high resolution data set of the atmospheric conditions of our planet over almost a million years at this point. So the project began by an inquiry into trying to understand the different knowledge practices that are mediated uh, by this very, in some way, very ordinary material that many of us, most of us are familiar with, ice, but something, a material that's also quite extraordinary. And so I was following, in some way, ice into different contexts. And I did begin with the more techno-scientific, as I said, I. The project began in an ice core archive. I then um, also traveled to a geochemistry lab where they do the um, analysis of greenhouse gases in the United States. And so, you know, moving from the space of the archive, which is effectively a, a, 
a big library of ice samples to a lab where the ice has to be cut, crushed and melted so you can extract uh, data from the ice. So the project began there. Um, and I was also at a certain point um, invited to participate in the Kochi Miseris Biennial, which is a, a biennial in India. And it was about the time that the pandemic um, hit. And so I thought, well, um, if I've been where I, and I had also been in Svalbard and in other um, places, but I thought, well, if I'm going to be doing something for um, an exhibition in India, surely it makes sense to also try and learn as much as I could or certainly learn more about cryospheric um, conditions in the Himalayas, in the Indian Himalayas. And that was the sort of origin um, of the work in India. I teach in London, but I have many students that I've worked with over the years and colleagues in India. So I reached out to FISA, who was a former MA student that I'd worked with, and I said, would you be interested in uh, assisting me with this research? Um, and FISA was keen, so we embarked upon a couple of years of reaching out to various um, people, anthropologists, scientists, um, activists, people working in NGOs, to really learn as much as we could about the um, about the the research that was happening in the um, Indian Himalayas. And as I said, COVID had just at this point, COVID had happened, which really um, it obviously for everybody uh, limited um, uh, opportunities for travel and to do uh, field work, but it also op it also um, meant that the scientists that I was interested in speaking to uh, were not in the field. They were in fact all at home and they were actually in a strange way, very accessible. And so Faiz and I, as I said, we spoke to many, many different people. I have a background in, um, in media and sound has been one of the most important significant features of my work. And also worked when I worked with climate scientists in the Netherlands, they were listening to, um, they were listening to atmospheric events and using various acoustic sensors to monitor um, monitor clouds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And already at that point, it was clear to me that acoustics in in environmental monitoring is both uh, uh, is is a very um, exciting. It was a very um, I think it was a very exciting uh, kind of like maybe discovery is the wrong word, but it was, I was really excited to find out that there was something that I shared with scientists from the point of view of using very similar kinds of methods um, and, and uh, techniques and instruments. I'm just gonna quickly see if I can change my slide or my image. Cause I wanna just, just to say that uh, maybe, I wonder if, leave that there. Um, but also the degree to which we shared a common kind of language. I'm giving you a very long story, so this will just help to set the context. But um, so when Faiz and I were talking to various scientists, um, we also talked to two people who've sort of pioneered the use of acoustics for monitoring glaciers. And uh, Grant and Dean and Oscar Golowski, they were working at Scripps Ocean Institution in the United States, and we're really, really generous with their time. And eventually, we we proposed the possibility of uh, using the techniques that they the the techniques and methods that they had established to monitor uh, glacial dynamics in the Himalayas, and that had never been done. And so Grant and Oscar also were training us uh, in the in the methods that they had utilized, because the field of glaciology is largely dominated by um, earth scientists who've studied physics. And that's the primary way that glaciers would have been, glacial change would have been monitored. It's through changes in the mass balance, the mass of the mass of the glacier and its movement. Um, using acoustics, which is a bit of an outlier, in was something very novel. 
uh, not many people, of course, do it, um, use it, utilize it, and it has to be like all modes of measurement, all modes of environmental measuring. Once one approach is never sufficient, you have to actually um, use multiple strategies that correlate data across um, across scales, if you will. Um, so, as I said, that's a bit of a long answer. So, uh, we proposed to work, uh, to use this method in the Himalayas, and then I was I wrote a grant ultimately a research grant to the British Council here in the UK to fund uh, this project under the sort of um, umbrella of COP26, and since Faiz and I had already been in touch with Farooq, who's a scientist based in India, who has been uh, working in the Himalayas, we suggested to Farooq that um, we collaborate and also work with um, acoustics and supplement the things that he would normally do, which is like meteorological um, measurements, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a little bit how the, the sort of project began. Um, and why we ended up uh, working in India and utilizing sound. But what we, I, I'm based in the humanities, as is FISA, so we also thought it was really important to not just use uh, sonic methods um, from a scientific kind of vantage point, but to uh, really explore all of the ways in which um, sonic methods and methods also not just of listening um, and not just methods of like uh, data capture uh, could be utilized but also you know engaging with local communities trying to think about ways in which um, sound could invite people into the scientific context etc I can say a little bit more but I mean, I just wanted to give you a little bit, uh, a, a sense of the kind of background to the project and the work working with FISA and how different people sort of fed into the project over time. But maybe I'll let you ask another question. Sure. That, no, that's great. Thank you, Susan. That's brilliant. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was uh, it was a really interesting dimension of your, your project that you weren't just working with uh, with scientists, but that you were also engaging with uh, with local communities why was it that you felt it was important to to make local communities part of of your work um in general and i have to maybe i'm general as i said in general and i'm generalizing i would have to say that the scientists when they work and do, when they do field work and of course uh unlike say antarctica the Himalayas are an environment where people live, and the same holds true for the Canadian Arctic and other, uh, in the circumpolar north. So Antarctica is actually quite an unusual place. Of course, people live there now as because they're all sort of doing research there, and ecotourism even is a thing there. But suffice to say that in most contexts, when scientists, um, you know, work in in these uh, oftentimes sort of very kind of remote kind of situations or they go into the Canadian Arctic, for example, um, there's a big difference between um, telling people this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it and it's just important and you kind of need to take that on sort of face, you need to take that at sort of face value. Um, we really wanted to say, like, wanted to produce a different dynamic that wasn't the sort of standard. We're the experts, and we're going to inform you and tell you why we're doing this and why we're here, et cetera, et cetera. Um, working with the community was kind of essential because the science, the you know, the 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 reason to do the scientific work is to um, is to is to, of course, uh, produce uh, the conditions whereby, as Farouk says in the short video, you know, he, these mountain villages are dealing with extreme water shortage. You know, their entire life worlds are completely reliant on 
uh, these glaciers that um, support their very, um, you know, their livelihoods, et cetera, et cetera, but also are the source oftentimes of flooding events that can destroy whole villages. So the science needs to be understood in service to the, um, to the communities that are directly impacted by the events that the scientists are um, studying. So, and, you know, Furuk understood that uh, there was only one reason to do the work as far as he's concerned, what, which was to actually um, understand, you know, understand these glaciers in, with a view to um, changing um, and intervening in the conditions that were bringing, bringing about their demise. Um, so, but from my perspective, so Farouk as a scientist knew the incredible importance of that science has to deal with society. Um, um, at the same time, as I said, uh, there is a, um, a tendency on the part of not just scientists, NGOs, etc. There is sometimes a tendency to just tell people and to be really didactic, in fact, and so it was for certainly for Faiza, myself, and also uh, Jigmit and Gunzang, who you see in the video, uh, we wanted to approach this project differently and also um, like invite people into the sort of, into the more kind of technical process. That's why we would, at the beginning, you see larger group of women coming onto the glacier. Those are the women from the, the kind of local village of Aksha, which is the village that's closest to that glacier. They've never been on that glacier. Um, but to give them a sense of what we were doing and to, and I thought of it from my point of view as kind of like, how could science produce the conditions of hospitality and invite people in to the sort of technical process so they had a sense of what was at stake. and so that we produced an experience, which is very different than just sort of talking at people. And it, so it was also about listening to people and listening to their stories and accounts of what had been happening in the environments in which they're living. And, you know, we're strangers in that place, of course. And so it was really important to change the dynamic and to, and not simply uh, um, enter into the context from the vantage point of scientific expertise, but to absolutely uh, ins insist on like participation of, of um, local communities for, for whom the stakes in fact are much, much higher. And at the same time to when you're when I was there, it's also like on some level incredibly difficult to connect the dots. Just on a personal level, I found it really hard to connect the dots between the conditions that these villages are experiencing in terms of extreme water shortage and their life is so directly impacted by what is happening in the sort of affluent West in terms of fossil fuel consumption, et cetera. Like when I was there and it's, you know, it was a very, as I said, very remote kind of um, environment, you know, I, for some, it, I, you know, I think it, it, that's, there's something about that, that sort of, um, Proximity to the condition of harm, but also realizing that the, the these affected communities are living through these incredible transformations uh, that are happening in a place in places that are also at, at such a geographic distance to them, and I, I that I found um, um, really just like very kind of challenging to somehow kind of process. So. Um, in answering your question, I think I've always tried to think about ways in which we could develop like relations of critical proximity in projects. Yeah. Mm. No, that's great. Thank you. And I mean, for me, watching that uh, that film, um, I think one of the things that that struck me is that it it 
it's, it's also educating, uh, educating us uh, to, you know, different uh, consequences of, uh, of climate change for people that we may not have been aware of. You know, when we think of melting glaciers, mm. often all we think of is rising sea levels and vanishing coastlines. Um, and that for us is the is the the consequence that we that we think of and you know to put it crudely it's this sort of you know almost too much water um resulting from uh, mm -hmm. from the melting glaciers and to think that actually it might be affecting people for the for the opposite reason that it's it's resulting in the disappearance of their their water supplies mm -hmm. something that we might not realize um no absolutely and uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, and that's the thing. It, it's um, like flood, what's called flood burst events. So the most villages in the Himalayas, uh, it, it makes sense that they would be located um, in proximity to these glacier, to these glacial streams. And so um, that's a, that would be a very different situation, for example, than in um, the Canadian high Arctic or in uh, Norway, Sweden, Finland, etc. Um, so the communities there, they rely on um, uh, runoff from the glaciers. That's how all of the um, irrigation of the fields, etc. happens. But because of the kind of accelerated melting, what we all, it's not just that the glaciers are disappearing. So we have water shortages. Uh, they're melting earlier. They melt when there is water. It's ha you know the the water is actually the run the spring runoff is coming too soon vis-a-vis -vis planting. But you also have accelerated melt, and that means that these little lakes that are at the um, mouth or tongue of every glacier there, they're they burst. They they flood, and entire villages are completely just washed out and people die in these flood burst events. And there was a, a major one just last year in Chamoli in India. So there's also, that's also quite a different situation than you would encounter, say, in other places where we're dealing with um, glacial recession. Is, is the, are these sort of flood burst events precisely because people are living um, so closely to these glaciers uh, which they rely on entirely for all aspects of their life in terms of like, yeah, access to water. Yeah, yeah. So there's quite a, a delicate balance that we're we're upsetting there. Um, mm -hmm. you, you spoke uh, in the in the film about uh, obviously the the, uh, the scientific research the which i guess you you could you could put under in the within the field of soundscape ecology or ecoacoustics uh, mm -hmm. um but uh, i suppose there's that other dimension of uh, of listening that's that's just the the sort of the, the direct listening to the to the process of the ice melting that's not being scientifically measured mm -hmm. but just directly experienced uh do you think there's something about uh, about listening to the sounds of of, of glacial melting that that makes it a, sort of a, a particularly powerful means of it, engaging with the process or engaging with the issue? Um, I would say yes, because in some way, um, uh, you know, the melting of a glacier has such direct material consequences, and those material consequences have such a strong acoustic they're expressed acoustically, they're expressed otherwise, but they have a strong uh, acoustic expression that is quite recognizable. So on some level, the sound of melting ice is definitely something that um, I think people can can relate to. And um, But I, I'd like to kind of qualify that by saying, um, you know, on the one hand, we do have this direct material expression of the transformation of a glacier that produces a very um, recognizable or produces a sound that we can recognize even though we don't know what that sound, the relevance of say the sound may be per se. Um, I wouldn't want to say that 
I don't want, what I wouldn't want to sort of emphasize is that this, um, that this sound has to be understood as a kind of melancholic sound of loss. Of course it is that, um, but um, I also think that um, it, it's, it would just be the beginning of the story, if you will. And, in, and so in, in some way in this project, it was really to think about what could sound, listening, hearing be across many, many different sort of registers. So only one of which was, but I, only one of which was the sound of, uh, of uh, melting. But in most cases, even when we are working with the various um, sensors and instruments that we used, the sound of melting was to establish the patterns of change of the glacier such that we can monitor the glacier over a period of time. It wasn't simply to be a signifier of the sort of melancholic loss of this, uh, these sort of material kind of worlds. So the sound was, um, we did approach the sound as a uh, way to have an effective experience, an embodied experience of the context. And uh, even for people who are living there and the women who were, we were working with, they had never um, uh, stood on a glacier, let alone listened to it. And they were really, really excited. And they, But they're also saying things like, it sounds like boiling tea. It sounds like the sound of a helicopter whirring overhead. So their understanding of the sound was um, uh, was expressed through their sort of everyday lives. And I really thought that was really kind of important. And then, but other aspects of the project was uh, like collecting um, song, listening to like um, stories and, uh, um, and also uh, listening to the a song collector who had collected songs of mountains and ice and snow and glaciers over many years since the 1960s, a very elderly man that we're helping to make uh, work on a book, a song book with him so that he really wants the song book to archive these songs that he himself is also um, forgetting and the language is already um, also being, that is also lost um, amongst younger generations. So there's sort of multiple, like loss of local knowledge, loss of glaciers, loss of um, traditions. Um, so the project has sort of many kind of registers and we're, so, you know, music and song isn't necessarily speaking like sound in the way that say sound studies might understand it, but it was like, what are the, different acoustic registers that could be activated um, in a project like this that is trying to get at, trying to understand climate change, but not always from a techno-scientific point of view. So the stories that people were telling us about the fact that the bears were coming down the mountain um, and being a pest and think like there was all these stories about bears that and the reason the bears are coming down is because their habitats have changed. So knowledge of climate change is ex um, locally through many different sort of like the many different stories that are being told. So, so environmental knowledge, I guess, is what I'm trying to say um, that we would understand as a consequence of climate change is carried in, it's carried by the sounds of materials that's carried in the kind of cultural expressions of et cetera, et cetera. So um, that was kind of the ways that that's the way that I thought that um, sound as a field uh, was an incredibly kind of productive uh, way of trying to mediate these many different sort of um, many different sort of registers or modes of expression from lived experience to cultural references to scientific inquiry. Fantastic. Yeah. And it, it feels to me like a particularly valuable aspect of that is the awareness that all of these things are, are happening right now. You know, we're not, we're not talking about 
consequences of climate change in 50 or 100 years or when the temperature rises by mm. a certain number of degrees. We're talking about things that are happening, happening to people right now. Um, you know, I think, I think for, for a lot of us, the impacts of climate change on our everyday lives are still relatively minimal so that if we want to, we can, we can mm -hmm. pretty much ignore it if we choose to. But this kind of tells us there are, no, there are plenty of people who, who absolutely cannot ignore it because it's, it's fundamentally changing their lives now. Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. That's why I said I, I, I did find it really hard to kind of, like on some kind of existential level, and kind of like why, like, like, why is it that you know, I'm from Canada. Like, why is it that the the things that we do as an affluent nation, in terms of like all of our activities, have such direct consequences for people who have never been um, the producers of those kinds of like. Um, uh, those, those like, they've never, they're not the people who are responsible for producing the kind of crisis. And it's like, that's always the case. You know, there's such a kind of like inequality in terms of, and I, I'm saying something that we already know, but I think every it, being in those kinds of contexts really kind of like um, makes that so explicit. We're living in London. I'm aware of it from a kind of more ambient, I guess, um, uh, a sort of more kind of ambient sort of every uh, perspective, right? In the media, in public discourse, in policy, et cetera, but not so directly in terms of uh, embodied lived experience. Um, and that's because I live in a, um, you know, like this is in, yeah, it's the conditions in which I'm living. And of course I'm speaking from an in, very um, kind of privileged kind of perspective here. Cause I'm extremely aware that many communities who are living with flood events or living with the kind of consequences of uh, accelerated warming in the North have, you know, have experienced this for a very, very long time, but that's like, anyway, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm rambling a little bit, but um, just to say that was my sort of like kind of, every day I had to somehow manage to reconcile this incommensurate sort of like reality uh, and the stories that were being told and, uh, you know, and confronting my own deep implication in those stories. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, it it almost feels like a, a sort of a, a new form of colonial violence. That's you know, but but from a distance. Um, yeah, it's it's a no, absolutely. Challenging, yeah. yeah, challenging issue to get to grips with. Um, I think we've got five minutes left, so I just wanted to quickly ask if there were any questions from the audience here for you. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for for your for your, for your work. <laughs> Not only the presentation, but I think your work and your awareness of of your privilege and and the way how you have worked there is, I think, is really exemplary. And um, I'm just remembering one of these uh, effects, sound effects, that is called the Sharawalji effect, which is to do with the sublime, which I studied mm. for the. Um, this is. Um, Jean-François Augogard, kind of um, in, in, in a book about sound effects, talk about this, and, and it's about all these sounds of, uh, that we don't know where are coming from, but are kind of very mm. thundering sounds and produces lots of fear, and which mm -hmm. I was kind of imagining with, with the sounds of, of the melting. Um, and, um, and at the same time, the sublimity of being in the, in the environment in an environment that mm -hmm. is, is um, uh, um, I mean, you were really, it could be really alien and at the same time disappearing. So there are lots of feelings there, as, as in your video, there were the feelings of uh, people like uh, with the hands and then having these, I don't know if they were biscuits or whatever, but, but there is something mm -hmm. embodied there 
of of sensing the whole mm -hmm. thing, which can be, I think, is frightening. Um, but at the same time, what you are doing, working in all these layers of uh, working with songs and working with rhythms, I I found that fascinating because because our layers that are super important in the now. So after all, saying all of that, um, I wonder if <laughs> your method is something that you are sharing with other scientists, because I think it's, I don't know a lot, but, uh, but each time I see scientists working in that, I wonder really how they are working with communities. Um, so I don't know about that, but I think you, your, your method, the way that you are approaching is something really to, to replicate. So I, I wonder if, if you are working in um, some sort of sharing that with other scientists, the process, or, yeah. This is what I wanted to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, you know, that's, thank you so much for that question. It's, it is crucial, and um, there's a couple of things I would say. Um, uh, the... You know, like it, in some way, it, it, no, it's interesting because I was in, uh, I was on a webinar actually for Icky Mode, which is this institution, this um, Institute for Climate Change in uh, Nepal, and um, had been invited to present some clips from this work. Also, and Furuk was there too. He was who is the lead scientist who was on, on the site. And we, we heard him speaking at, a, at various times in the video. And so, and it, we were um, reflecting on the, the recent, uh, the last uh, public, the recent publication of the IPCC assessment report for the cryosphere, which is the cryosphere, cryosphere being the frozen environments. And so, and all the scientists are going like, um, you know, but how do we engage with communities? And it was kind of like, I thought it was, and in some way I realized that, well, they were asking themselves that even though I had presented the work that we had done, but because I wasn't a scientist at the end of the day, I, it was, I thought, oh, this is, but, well, that's, I thought this is kind of, an, I found it, um, so in some way surprising because I had presented some of the materials that, um, like you just saw, and Farouk, who is a scientist, was there, but because the activities that we were doing were not coming directly out of like a group of scientists necessarily um, doing that, there's, the scientists were still asking themselves, how is it that we can engage with communities? And I'm thinking, yeah, but we've we've just given you some examples of how you might want to um, work. Um, so I think, but at the same time, they're quite, they were very open um, and, and, and they understood the necessity of community engagement. The one thing that they did, they weren't, they were still asking themselves like, you know, like, can we actually use something like, they said like, we're curious to know whether this like, how um, acoustic monitoring could be incorporated into like long-term uh, environmental monitoring. Um, so I guess they were still in some way, uh, they're open to the possibility and curious to see what, uh, what it could actually yield, but also I suppose had a certain, um, some reservations about, um, you know, like, like the, the practical, um, contribution it could make like it's no, ra not practical but let's say demonstrated contribution um, so that's going to take uh, some time now the two scientists that I mentioned that are using acoustics in fjord environments uh, Oscar and Grant they publish many sort of papers but they're still considered relatively experimental uh, the one thing I would say um, and in answer to your question, is that remote sensing, for example, has completely transformed the way in which most um, Earth scientists work. And, you know, that's a relatively, uh, uh, you know, it's been around, sure, since the 70s, but it's a relatively new method for 
conducting uh, long, like large scale environmental monitoring. Um, and that has really supplemented the sort of uh, field work that scientists do, what they call ground truthing as well. So I think the, um, the possibilities of using acoustics to supplement existing forms of measurement, et cetera, um, you know, is absolutely kind of vital. And like with all modes of environmental sensing, whether they're technical, embodied, sensorial, um, what have you, they all need to be in some way correlated and cross-referenced to give it, to provide a bigger and a more holistic uh, picture and uh, soundscape, if you will, of what is going on. So um, there was an openness, but also, as I said, not, you know, like, I think it's this, for me, I felt the the model was also in some way, I wasn't, we weren't even, uh, what what did I want to say? The model of 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 doing the sort of deep listening workshops and working with the communities, et cetera, et cetera, also I think needs to be taken on board by the NGO communities because they also we met a, a an NGO that, for example, was giving cameras to um, villagers in different um, throughout Ladakh, and they said. You know, but we gave these cameras to people, but they didn't really use them and take pictures because we wanted them to take pictures of how, how things were changing in their local kind of village. And I was thinking, well, you can't just give people cameras and expect them to turn them into sort of like environmental journalists. You have to work with communities. You have just to be training. And it's not just a question of like, let's hear some cameras and like, um, can you please become our kind of environmental monitors? Uh, like how do, how do people, uh, how, you know, you, people need to have stakes and those stakes need to be, you need to, it needs to be a communal or a common, an experience where uh, you establish trust and you're, you're sharing knowledge and you're, you know, I just think there's such a lack of fundamental listening sometimes that is so, really is 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 in my opinion is probably the first hurdle that needs to be overcome before we can even um, speak about um, applying these sort of methods that we've been trying to develop because um, there's such a kind of lack of the capacity sometimes to listen to um, others who were working in um, working and, and you working very kind of differently. Yeah. I don't know if that helps. Uh, I don't know if that's the kind of answer that you are interested in. Uh, but those are some of my sort of immediate thoughts. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just think that uh, what you said that um, from the perspective of um, science, science as a hard science, not humanity science, but hard mm. sciences, the, the idea of the pressure of demonstrate thing is really different than the processes that humanities deal with. So I think it goes again to, to the whole collaboration and interdisciplinary collaboration, trying to listen from, from each other um, because they never will become like uh, sci scient humanities scientists and the humanities never will become, I mean, yeah. So it needs a lot of listening <laughs> between the different disciplines. We cannot uh, transform, uh, uh, yeah, all our paths, but yes, try to find um, things. Um, yeah, but just that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. And and the one thing I have to say, I've been very fortunate to work with some really amazing people, scientists that were extremely generous with their time, their knowledge, uh, very open to collaboration. So a lot of what I've been saying is also me making quite sort of generalized sort of comments. And it's and I've had you know the work that I've been able to do in collaboration with others has been working with different kinds of scientists. But and I, the other I would like to say too is like, I also don't want the humanities to be this place where we just do uh, 
like wishy-washy work. Uh, I want it to be, a, you know, I want to be as precise in the work that I do, but it's, it's precise in a different way. Um, so it's not to say that anything goes. That I'm, I'm definitely not a, an advocate of. And that is also why I said earlier, um, just to, like, I'm not really committed to uh, treating glaciers as melancholic objects that are, like, yes, they're endangered and we're losing the world's ice sheets, etc. But staying in some sort of melancholic register, I just think is not actually, is not practically useful. It, it can produce an empathy and an affect, but this is also why I say we need to work as artists as um, and a cultural um, producers, as in a, with as much precision uh, that we would ex that a, that a, a scientist would expect of their peer community in terms of um, learning about informing ourselves about the context in which we are working, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and maybe the one thing I didn't really say, which I think is really important, is that in relationship to sound is the fact that so many um, so many of the uh, consequences of climate change are often happening, happening at scales that aren't producing sort of, uh, there's, they're not happening according to, uh, in a way that humans can perceive them necessarily, both in terms of say the scale or the temporality. So I think sound also capturing, it's also, that which doesn't privilege, as Faiza said, um, uh, human perception. And so we wouldn't see a glacier necessarily moving or receding, but the sound actually um, allows us to perceive something that the visual isn't fully capable of doing. And I think that's often the case when it comes to um, uh, climate change events. Yeah. Great. Brilliant. Well, I think we have to call it. Oh, do we have time for more question or? Okay, we have. So not, <laughs> a very quick one. <laughs> yeah, I'll just, keep my just, answer short. <laughs> yeah, just, just a short yeah. question, short answer. So I'm a um, curator working with artists in ice house, former ice houses, very nice. So my question to you is um, what can we do as curators for you? <laughs> that was going to be the short question. <laughs> That's the short <laughs> question. <laughs> so, did you say that you work in ice houses? No, no, I miss. Where do you work? Yes, in ice houses. So, just just in the old time when uh, be, before uh, the the climate change, or in the we we call it also after the little ice age, there was plenty of mm -hmm. ice in the lakes in Germany and uh, just, uh, just um, close to stately homes, uh, they had little ice houses where, where they store the ice. And oh, yes, this, yes. So, and yeah, these, these are cute little rooms, spaces to, to work with artists in and uh, with small audience. So, um, and yeah, so it, it w would be great to, um, think about to reflect if just just from from a, a curatorial perspective if you think uh, that we should probably um, think about other formats of outreach to support to make it stronger in public or so what what do you do you think is, is there something what we can do for artists like you mm. or for you I mean, what I would what I would say is I'm I am aware of the ice cellars here in that were built during the Victorian period in Britain, and I don't know if it would be the same in Germany. But I think what what's really interesting about those architectures is the fact that ice becomes a commodity, um, and it starts and uh, it starts to enter into um, relationships of trade and commerce. And so within the, the British context, uh, there's a term called pink ice. So 
colonial enterprise starts to incorporate the movement of large chunks of ice so that a certain privileged um, class could have things like, you know, ice lollies and sorbets and things like that. So there's a there's a colonial material history to ice as um, that one can actually locate back to the invention of these ice cellars where ice is starting to become part of globally a global trade kind of network. So to me, that's what I would actually find interesting is this is the transformation of in environmental materials into um, the objects of trade and circulation that are part of other kinds of like circulation systems that are other parts of other kind of colonial kind of legacies, etc. Um, and there was a trade in ice that I'm, very, I'm aware of in Norway as well, where um, large chunks of glacier ice were being taken and carried. I mean, really backbreaking back work and that were carried and, and taken into Bergen. I think you could trace ice then, you know, in and that that's, of course, uh, that would have been related to fishing, et cetera, and refrigeration and the birth an invention of artificial cold. So I think the story of these ice cellars would be, is incredibly fascinating because it's another, it's a story about ice that takes us into um, different contexts again. Um, and I think to start, sort of produce those connections, uh, I think would be an amazing curatorial project to, to uh, develop, yeah. Yeah, I think we have to leave it there. Thank you so much, Susan, for being here and joining us also online, joining us for the nice moderation and questions. And of course, to all of you for joining us for this conversation and those of you who are also online, thanks a lot. And of course, all my wonderful colleagues who are here in the production team making it happen with this very complicated technology today. So thank you so much. And come back tomorrow. We will have also very nice conversations. Thank you so Great. much. Thanks, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.